The next speaker is uh, Erin Cox. She's going to talk about magnetic morphology at this size scale. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, so today I'm going to be talking to you about magnetic fields on disk size scales. Okay, so throughout these past few days, we've been hearing some really great talks about magnetic fields on larger size scales. So when I say large, I'm talking more like gas and dust clouds, not galactic size scales, um, and how magnetic fields influence the formation of stars. So today I'm going to be talking to you about smaller size scales, so in this regime, and how they influence disk formation. Okay, and the reason that we care about this is this is where planets form, and this is also likely um, where binaries form. Okay, so some questions that motivate this work are what role do magnetic fields play in disk formation at such an early stage? So from there, we can ask how common are disks at the very youngest stages of protostars? And then in the past, or in the last few years, we've um, observed a handful of large, so maybe around 100 AU scales, um, disks at very young stages. And so what does the morphology of the magnetic field look like in these sources? And finally, we have a lot of observations of disks as, in more evolved um, protostars. So what does the magnetic field, how does it change over time? So if we observe the morphology at the very youngest stages, what does it look like compared to that of more evolved systems? So when I say youngest stage, I'm talking about class zero objects. So we've had a nice introduction into class zero objects this morning. So these are the youngest, most embedded sources of protostars. And these are very difficult to observe because they're very embedded in dust. So we know that by the class one stage, uh, we see lots of disks. So we want to look at even younger stages um, because at the class zero stage, this is likely the initial conditions for disk formation. So we want to see what the magnetic fields look like in those sources. Okay, so in theoretical simulations, um, the alignment of the magnetic field with the rotation axis of these systems is very important. So if we have an aligned magnetic field with the rotation axis, then magnetic braking is very efficient. And so if we have an efficient magnetic braking, we don't need to form a disk because the material can lose angular momentum along the magnetic field lines. And observationally, we see this um, at least on the envelope size scales. So this is a nice image from the Tadpole survey. And here we see the outflow, which we use as a proxy for a rotation. And the magnetic field is aligned. And this is L1157. There's no observable disk down to about 15 AU. And so conversely, if we have um, a magnetic field where the alignment is perpendicular or misaligned to the rotation axis, then you don't have efficient magnetic braking and you have to grow a large disk. And again, we see this on envelope size scales. Uh, this is VLA 1623. And there, this has a large uh, disk, so it's about 150 AU. And you can see the nice perpendicular magnetic field. So that's great that um, on envelope size scales, we can use this as a signpost as to whether or not disks are going to form in these very young sources. But what happens um, you know, more in the disk regime, in the disk size regime? So what does the magnetic field look like closer into the protostar? Well, like I said, that's difficult to do. So we recently completed a survey, the Van Dam survey. It stands for Very Large Nascent Disk and Multiplicity Survey. And um, we observed the Perseus molecular cloud, all 90 protostars in this cloud, and we had very high resolution. So it was about 12 AU was our best resolution. So we're looking very, very close into these sources. And the observations were taken at two different bands, so eight millimeters and one centimeter to characterize the dust emission, and then at four and six centimeters to characterize the free-free emission. 
And there are a few different science goals, as you probably could tell from what the survey stands for. Um, multiplicity disk modeling, which if you have um, any questions about that, there's a really lovely poster outside by Dominique that goes over that. And also polarization of these sources. Okay, so a little bit about Perseus. So this is a large star forming region that's close to us. It's about 230 parsecs away. Um, shown here in the green are the CO isotopologues. And then we have different star forming clouds inside of this region. Um, so NGC 1333 is the most active star forming region. And there's lots of class zero and class one protostars inside of this region. Okay, right, so we heard a lot about IRS 4A earlier. It's very well studied. It's a very bright object in this cloud. Um, this is a nine millimeter continuum image, and you can very nicely see the two different protostars. It's a binary system. It's about 420 par, not parsecs, AU, in separation. Um, and the Black contours are just the total dust emission. So this is a very young source. It's about 10,000 years old. So by studying the source, we're really looking at the very earliest stages of star formation. OK, so like I said, it's been very well studied. And so this is a nice image of what the magnetic field looks like on um, maybe 1,000 AU scales. You see a really nice hourglass morphology which, um, as we heard earlier, is expected in these sources. So if we zoom in um, to, this, to the southern source um, with our data, we see a much different morphology. So we had much higher resolution with the VLA. And I'll make that bigger so you guys can see it easier. And so you notice that this is our magnetic field, um, or inferred magnetic field from polarization. And you see a really um, nice, almost circular morphology. So this was completely unexpected, right? Because all the other observations showed the nice hourglass shape. And so we see this, and we were like, oh my gosh, that's so exciting. Another really cool thing <laughs> is that um, I want to direct your eyes to this <laughs> vector length here. So that's 10%. And so we see actually the highest polarization fraction at about 18%. And we were not expecting that at all. And the reason for this is that um, previous sources, previous older sources, we get polarization fractions of about a few percent, nowhere near this high. So we were like, oh, wow, we have to like, look at this um, and see what's going on. And then um, just for completeness, the color bar does indicate um, polarized intensity in Jansky's per beam, sorry. Um, so another source in our survey um, was IC348 MMS. And so this source is interesting because it's a class zero disk candidate. Um, and here, again, we see very large polarization percentages at about 10 to 12%. So not expected at all. Switching gears a little bit, this um, L1527 is another class zero source not in our survey. Um, this source is actually in Taurus, but it's very well studied. So we want to compare our results um, with different wavelengths and see how the magnetic field changes you know, over a regime of wavelengths. So over on the right, you have this Spitzer image. See the nice <laughs> outflows. And then you have higher resolution Gemini imaging, which really clearly shows you the disk. So this is, has a confirmed disk. And this is what the magnetic field looks like in this disk. And so right away, you can see it's very different. So this vector is 3%. So on average, the polarization fraction in this source is much lower than what we see. Now, this was taken with karma at 1.3 millimeters. And so it's unclear if this is source dependent or if this is wavelength dependent on how high the polarization fraction is. So we have to do more work with that. OK, so another thing that we have to talk about is, is this polarized emission that we're seeing actually align dust grains with the magnetic field? And we first thought that it was at 8 millimeters. We didn't think we really had to worry that much about scattering. But it's showing that we actually do. 
And um, scattering can depend on a few different things, like the inclination, inclination angle of the disk, and also the dust properties of the disk. And so our work on IRAS 4A actually inspired our collaborators in Virginia to do some simulations uh, specifically on this source. So on the right over here, this is very similar to what I showed you before. However, instead of the inferred magnetic field, I'm showing the polarization vectors. And on the left is what the simulations showed with, um, from the newest paper by Yang et al. Um, they were, so this particular image is scattering plus aligned grains. And the conclusions were that scattering is important at eight millimeters. However, they found that scattering is really only important in the inner regions and also right along this axis. So over here, that would be right about here and right here. And then these over here, they actually do believe are aligned dust grains with the magnetic field. So what's next? Well, we have um, hopefully some ALMA time coming, except after seeing some of the ALMA images today, it looks like that might actually pose more questions than it does answer them. Um, and then we also applied for kinematic data on IRAS-4A. Our images of the inferred magnetic field, um, it's really tantalizing to want to say that it's a rotating disk. Um, we can't really say that yet, but we hopefully can get some kinematic data on that. And then ALMA doesn't allow for Zeeman observations, but we did apply for a CN snapshot around class zero objects so that when it does allow for Zeeman observations, um, we know which sources to look at. And then we have a pending IRS4A observation with SOFIA using Hawk Plus which will be looking at the large scale magnetic field around IRS-4A. And then a very similar survey, um, very similar to Van Dam we have going on in Orion. Questions? I have uh, a question. So about the scattering, uh, you have this model. Uh, I guess you can also predict a uh, uh, different wavelength behavior because you have the scattering depends on the wavelength or mm -hmm. the alignment. Do you have any plan to do that, or do you have all the, da the BLA data is good enough to check that? Um, so I'm not actually sure. So um, this was the scattering stuff was brand new. Um, within the past few months. And so um, I think because we have the, maybe using other observations at different wavelengths yeah. um, and modeling that, we can. Okay. Well, I'm just wondering if your, um, uh, if your ALMA data show a rotating disk around IRS-4A, um, there's already a lot of material there, apparently, and if you maybe discount the polarization direction due to scattering, you still have the fact that in the, you know, it l appears that the magnetic field in the envelope is parallel with the outflow. So that, if you find a large disk there, that would sort of uh, invalidate the idea that magnetic breaking um, prevents the formation of large disks that are uh, with the, the field. Uh, perpendicular to the disk? Okay. I'll let the theorists uh, worry about that. Well, I have a question about disk detection. So could the field actually be anti-aligned significantly in the, in, the, in, the pla in the part we can't see, right? That's the beauty of this argument is that it can be any direction. I, I can answer that question. So uh, the magnetic breaking is only very efficient when you have ideal MHD uh, 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 assumptions. Uh, normally in this cloud, uh, you have amber polar diffusions even in the envelope. So that will give you roughly 50 AU disk, depending on the initial conditions, like the uh, rotation speed of the cloud. So even with lambda equal two or three, you can get pretty large disk. Just one quick one about the scattering. 
Um, I, this is partially just clarification for me. I know that some of the early, some of the scattering papers by Kataoka, that was mainly millimeter to fit to HL Tau, mm -hmm. right? Is the one that you showed by Young, is that actually eight millimeter or seven millimeter yes, scattering? Yes, it was actually, it was because of what we mm -hmm. observed in IRS 4A, why they went and they did a specific simulation. And, s and so is that suggesting that you just have unbelievably <laughs> large dust grains in there to scatter at that long a wavelength? Um, I would say yes, but other people might disagree. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, let's move to the next talk. Thanks again, Regan.